Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Inserting the IoT into LTE and 5G, sponsored by ARIS. I'm Colin Gibbs. I'm the editor of Fierce Wireless, and I'll be, mo I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Joe Madden, who's the principal a analyst for Mobile Experts, David Allen, Director of Advanced Product Development for AT&T Internet of Things Solutions, Dave Schendel, CTO and Executive Vice President of Engineering for Senate, and Z Hossein, the CTO for Eris. You can read their full bios on the right side of your window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the resources list at the bottom of your screen. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your volume is up. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help bot button at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being, con is being recorded excuse me, and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. We will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Um, some questions will come from me, and we're encouraging the audience to, uh, to offer up questions as well. Please submit your questions using the Q&A button on the left side of your screen. Okay, now, let's begin. Joe, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Colin. Uh, this is Joe Madden with Mobile Experts. And uh, just a quick introduction, Mobile Experts, you, many of you may have seen us in the LTE market. We publish market research related to uh, handsets and base stations and so on. Uh, for the last two years, we've, uh, we've been taking the IoT research uh, very seriously and, and breaking this uh, large thing that we call the IoT market into various pieces, uh, doing vertical market studies on automotive and asset tracking and healthcare, smart meters, industrial, as well as technical studies on cellular IoT, uh, LPWA, and uh, 5G. Um, we're underway looking at semiconductors for IoT right now. And uh, you know, diving into some of the high-level view of how we see the market, I'd, what I'd like to do is set the stage for some of our discussion today uh, by just talking about what the IoT is and what the IoT is not. Um, I think many people have heard about 20 billion devices out there in the 2020 time frame. Um, I, I think that that it's useful to say that it's a big market, but in fact, we we break it into smaller chunks to to talk about more useful aspects of this market. Um, and when we look at the installed base in uh, 2022, we see that there would be about 8 billion true IoT devices. Uh, so it's, it's a smaller number. I think the, the way that we get to 20 billion is when we look at things like RFID and smartphones and other devices and add up the total number of connected devices, uh, that's how you can get to 20 billion. Um, the, the IoT devices that we're looking at uh, really break down into 12 major market sectors. And, and, uh, and when we talk about the uh, definition of IoT, we're talking about devices that, that have an IoT address, uh, an IP address, and that uh, work more or less autonomously, uh, and, uh, and therefore they're somewhat distinct from things like smartphones or RFID tags. Uh, one quick note is we're, we're tracking a huge variety in this market. We're, we're tracking these, these 12 major markets, but in fact that breaks down into hundreds or even thousands of applications, and we're, uh, we're looking at 65 different connectivity technologies that can be used. So it's incredibly fragmented and complex. Um, and as we look at this migration over time, we, we do expect uh, the technology choices to change. We, we have some new choices coming out, which, which really I think we're, we'll be opening up some new markets, especially on the enterprise side. Um, uh, right now, if you look at the 2017 picture on the upper left, uh, we have about 180 million wired IoT devices shipping this year. That would be a lot of manufacturing devices using field bus or Ethernet connectivity. Um, we have some short range, range wireless, a little over half the market, and then long range wireless, which is GSM and LTE today. Uh, as we move forward to 2022, uh, we see a lot of growth going on in, uh, in both the short range wireless and Bluetooth and Zigbee, uh, those types of protocols, uh, as well as in the, the long range case, uh, where we see a lot more uh, long range mobile and uh, nomadic type of applications coming out. Uh, so uh, this dramatic growth, especially in the long range wireless area. And uh, if you were to look at that in terms of revenue, it would be even more dramatic toward the long range standard. Okay. Um, 
One thing I thought I'd show today, just to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the forecast details, but I thought I would show one, one thing that we do in, in terms of looking at various technologies. Uh, we've gone into some real depth in, in terms of comparing different technologies, and we've got a, a big matrix like this for, for Sigfox and LoRa and Ingenue and, and several other unlicensed standards, as well as uh, LTE CAD-M and narrowband IoT and 5G and so on. Uh, just to show an example of, of a head-to-head -head comparison of LoRa and narrowband IoT, uh, we can see some advantages and disadvantages for each one. Um, so in the case of these two, we, we see a, a real advantage in terms of the licensed uh, narrowband IoT approach in terms of the range or link budget. Um, power consumption is about the same. Uh, when we, we use a test case of about 100 kilobytes per day, uh, LoRa and narrowband IoT seem to be about the same. Uh, but for different levels of data usage, uh, there are uh, some sweet spots for one or the other to, uh, to actually uh, have an advantage over the other. Uh, device density is more or less unproven, but, but either of these we expect to be able to reach tens of thousands of devices per access point. Uh, and then in terms of module cost, uh, we expect to see LoRa with a lower cost than narrowband IoT. So, you know, the way we look at this, uh, as we look at these technical factors as well as the business model factors, is that uh, LoRa is likely to be uh, what we think of as the Wi-Fi of the long-range IoT market. Uh, there's going to be a lot of enterprise usage, ad hoc usage. Uh, there will be some uh, carrier-deployed networks, uh, like we'll hear about from Senate later. Uh, and, uh, and so I think LoRa will be very successful due to its low cost and its uh, uh, ability to be ubiquitous and sort of ad hoc. Um, and then on the other hand, we have things like CAD-M and narrowband IoT, which are really premium services, uh, where we're going to have higher reliability, uh, longer range. Um, in some cases, uh, we'll have uh, great battery performance, and, uh, and the cost isn't bad, but it is higher than, than we have for LoRa. Uh, so that's just one quick view. We have a lot more details in the link shown at the bottom of that slide. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd just kind of kick off by, by saying the IoT market is huge uh, and growing fast. We, we see many aspects of the market which are practically doubling every year right now, um, and many of these different applications are, are moving fast. Uh, we, uh, we've looked into some of the technical differences, and, and between those 65 different connection technologies, uh, we think over the next 10 years that will probably consolidate down into the 35 to 40 range, but uh, it's not going to come down to just one or two answers. We're, we're going to have a whole lot of different uh, fragments of this IoT market to come. Uh, with that, I guess I'll hand off to David Allen from AT&T, and uh, love to hear what you're up to, David. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, my name is David Allen, and I'm with AT&T. I'm the director of our Advanced Network Evolution. Um, as many of you may be aware, AT&T has been in the IoT industry for a very long time. AT&T is considered one of the largest global IoT providers in the world, uh, along with a couple of other uh, global mobile network operators. As, uh, as Joe uh, pointed out during his discussion, it's really kind of important to take kind of a step back in a broader view. The importance in IoT is to have a global broad reach. This includes historically uh, global, global cellular connectivity. It now includes some of the new LPWA technologies that we're about to talk about and focus more during this webinar. It also includes a global reach through satellite, through short range technologies, and through wireline technologies. It's important to have that broad perspective because no single customer or enterprise customers it's just looking for one answer. No single technology solves all problems. And so by being able to offer a broad connectivity palette, you can address many of the use cases that enterprises are looking for, for high bandwidth needs, medium bandwidth needs, very low bandwidth needs, along with some certain features and functions that we'll get into in the next several slides. LPWA is one of these solutions or technologies that can be made available to enterprise customers. As we look at the evolution of the global standards, 
you see that we've started out way back in the early, early 80s with analog, with 1G, and we've evolved to 2G, 3G. 4G is what's here and now today, as we'll talk about a little bit more with LTE, LTE Advanced, and of course, LTE-M and narrowband IoT in the LPWA categories. That's a stepping stone and an evolution to 5G coming down the pipe. Standardization, and of course, we're with AT&T, standardization is extremely important. And investing in a standards technology is critical on this step, uh, stepping path to 5G. What standardization really provides provides everyone is interoperability. And you want to have a very broad ecosystem of providers from chipsets to modules to RAN vendors to network solutions. Standardization provides you global reach so that a solution can be available in the US market, the Asian market, or the European market. And most importantly, standardization brings scale. And scale brings volume. And volume drives down the cost of goods. And then that's how we can pass on lower cost solutions, especially in the IoT marketplace. So what is LTM specifically? at and has launched a nationwide LTM network earlier this year. And LTM is one of the licensed versions of LPWA along with its counterpart, narrowband IoT. Some of the key benefits of LTM that we've seen already is the chipset size. I was just on a previous webinar earlier this morning where Altair was presenting, and Altair had shown a LTEM chipset that is literally 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters by 1 by, by 1.28 millimeters. And that is incredibly tiny. That same fab supports both LTEM and narrowband IoT. In addition to that, some of the other benefits of LTEM and LPWA is extended coverage, RF coverage, up to 15 dB improved coverage over standard LTE. Another key benefit is extended battery life, whereas in historically in cellular you could expect, you know, three, four days, up to two weeks of battery life. You know, we're now looking at years, up to 10 plus years of extended battery life with power saving mode in EDRX. And as Joe pointed out, the price of, of LTM and narrowband IoT modules is coming down dramatically. Whereas it wasn't that long ago, an LTE module was at $14.90. It's introduced at $7.50. And we've just seen presentations by some of the chipset manufacturers at Mobile World Congress because two weeks ago that they fully expect it to be sub $5 range in the very, very near future. So you can see that many, if not all of our LPWA technologies, LTEM, Narrowband IoT, LoRa, Sigfox, Ingenue, all offer kind of the same value proposition. But the one thing that caused AT&T and several other mobile network operators to launch LTM first is that it offers some capabilities that are unique to, to LTM that aren't supported in other technologies. And those are voice support, particularly Volte, mobility, which is very important to the wearables market, and bandwidth to support firmware over the air and software over the air updates, which is Photosoda. And in prior presentations, we have seen where somebody has deployed another technology that has a very low bandwidth. And when the enterprise needs to upgrade their firmware on the device, they need to switch over to an alternate technology to do the firmware upgrades and then switch back to their technology. So with LTEM, we find that it re removes that complexity of transport migrations. So what are some of the use cases? So, so we show kind of a range of technologies starting with like LTE CAT4, we show CAT1, and we show LTM in the vertical graph. And some of the use cases that fit 
for those various types of bandwidth. But I'm going to focus really on kind of two examples here that we've experienced by AT&T. One is in the alarm and security industry. So AT&T, the alarm and security industry has been a longtime user of IoT services. And if everyone, if you're aware of your home, you know, you have an alarm panel within your house. Or if you're in a business, you have an alarm panel on the, on the first floor. That alarm panel can support your video cameras. So you need a high bandwidth Cat4 backhaul to support streaming video. You need a modest bandwidth capabilities to support a lot of the data that's being transmitted between the, 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 the home or the enterprise and the alarm monitoring company. And you need voice support so that your monitoring company can communicate with the homeowner while they're in their home. And you need very low bandwidth uh, technologies for things like your sensors, your door alarms, your smoke detectors, and things like that. So that's a perfect use case of a single enterprise vertical use case requiring a broad range of services. And then another example for LPWA in particular is what I would call the full empty use case or the on-off use case. You know, everyone's probably seen the connected trash can or the connected oil storage container next to the oil drill, drilling well. And historically, you could address those te technically, but you couldn't address those use cases economically. And now with LTEM, you can put a sensor in a trash can. That sensor can last in the field for multiple, multiple, multiple years. And as the trash can is full, it sends off a trigger that says, I need to be picked up. So rather than having a waste management company pick up that trash three times a week, now you can do route optimization, save a lot of cost, and only pick up the trash as it's full. The other use case that goes along with that is the on-off use case. Everyone's probably seen the button use case, whether it's on a concierge desk, whether it's on your, your refrigerator or your washing machine. And with a button use case, you press a button and an action occurs. That is the ideal use case around LPWA and LTEM. And so those are the those are two use cases that you'll see cross a wide range of vertical segments. These are some of the uh, more details around the key benefits of a, of a LTEM versus some of the unlicensed technologies. You know, it's important to talk about standards, and we talked about that earlier in the presentation. It's important to have dedicated spectrum, particularly around a mobile network operator like AT&T. Dedicated spectrum means it's clean spectrum. It's managed spectrum, and you don't have a lot of noise that you're trying to, to address within that spectrum. It's also important to be able to do a one-stop shop. So as a, as a security or alarm industry enterprise companies, they want to be able to go to a single provider that provides all those various transports. They want to be able to manage their SIMs through an online portal and through APIs. They want real-time alerts. They want security, and they all went in on a single bill. You need to give broad, broad coverage, not only within the U.S., but globally as well. And so those are the things that a single source solution provider can offer. And this all leads to the path of 5G, right? We're investing in the evolution and standardization of wireless technology. So as we've gone from 1G to 2G, 2G to 3G, 3G today's 4G, 4G is being used as the building block to get to 5G. And then some of the key value propositions within 5G are the ultra low latencies, improved reliability, but one of the key value propositions in 5G that'll pertain to IoT is the ultra low latency. It's important to be able to offer ultra low latency for things like command and control. In other words, for things like drones, once you have drones that move out of line of sight, you still want to be able to have real-time command and control of that drone, even though it's not within your line of sight anymore. Or 5G will be used for that ultra-low latencies for the autonomous car, the connected car. Whether it's vehicle-to-infrastructure or vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, you require that ultra-low latency to be able to address those use cases within the connected car, autonomous car, use cases. So with that, that concludes my presentation.
And I believe I will turn this over to the other Dave. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Um, just uh, by way of brief introduction, uh, my name, as mentioned before, is Dave Schendel. I am the CTO of a startup called Senate. Um, Senate uh, is a uh, leading provider of uh, a cloud-based platform that enables uh, low-power wide area networks, specifically on the LoRaWAN standard. Um, we offer those as uh, public networks, as uh, public-private hybrids. Um, and as managed network services for, for operators. And all of those disparate types of networks can be combined into a, a single um, ubiquitous network using some technology that we've developed uh, that we call the LPWA virtual, virtual network. Um, and I'd like to spend uh, a, few, a few minutes to talk about uh, a slightly different perspective uh, on the unlicensed side here. I won't spend really uh, any time in this slide, since we've already mentioned several of these kind of aspects before, but suffice it to say that the market is very, very large. Um, and, and we, we very much believe, um, and, uh, the, many of the players in the, uh, in the broad low power wide area, um, space believe that there is, uh, plenty of room in the market for all these different technologies. And I think you saw that, uh, from what uh, Joe presented earlier. Uh, and certainly even what David just mentioned here now. Uh, we do believe that these low-power wide area technologies, uh, both the licensed and unlicensed um, uh, forms of that, will comprise a very significant portion of the, of the market uh, for IoT connectivity. Uh, as, as you've heard along the way, there's really these key advantages and these key opportunities to take advantage of the characteristics of these devices um, in order to provide unique, uh, unique uh, solutions that are really required in order to facilitate the kinds of deployments that we're anticipating. In order to reach those scales of billions of devices, there's some unique characteristics that need to be uh, available of the underlying technologies and of the companies that are providing that service in the space. So I'd like to talk about what some of, a few of those really are uh, here specifically, uh, looking at how we deliver those in the context of this new IoT landscape. So certainly low-cost infrastructure. So we've talked a lot uh, already about low cost of the end device, but low cost of infrastructure is another key, uh, key aspect. So this relates to, uh, as well, uh, the, the cost of license spectrum, the cost of base stations to, to be deployed upon those, and uh, the ways in which those, uh, that infrastructure can be, uh, can be deployed by different organizations, whether that's a carrier, an enterprise, um, or a specific vertical application. We agree wholeheartedly, again, uh, with what uh, David just mentioned. Standard base is required for, for guaranteed interoperability and for global deployments. Uh, Laura Land supports this with the Laura Alliance and the standards that we are producing there uh, that have been deployed uh, already around the world uh, in, uh, in really every market. Um, Certainly, you have to be able to deploy rapidly. So rapid deployment here, we're really talking, certainly there's an aspect of that at the, on the network core side, but on the end device side as well. Uh, and there's some, there's some elements of the techn technologies that need to be available in order to support that. Uh, and specifically, it relates to how security is provided. And end-to-end -end security for global deployments is a key element of, uh, of the lower WAN um, specification and the use cases that we're deploying uh, globally today. Uh, centralized control architectures lead to scalable device management, uh, seamless uh, inter- and intranetwork roaming. Um, and one of the things that differentiates us a little bit with, uh, from, the, uh, from the previous discussion is really uh, you know, a vision to follow in this, uh, this good enough footste footsteps of, of TCP, IP, and Ethernet. And as Joe mentioned earlier, a way to characterize it is potentially as, uh, you know, as the Wi-Fi of, uh, of long-range connectivity. Um, but this is really important because we believe that there's a very large segment of the, of the use cases that are, um, that are going to be uh, brought to market and are being brought to market where this is the ideal, um, the ideal uh, approach. Uh, so that said, I want to take a few minutes to run through a few of the use cases that we are currently deploying and our partners are currently deploying uh, around the world on these, uh, on these kinds of technologies. Uh, the first piece I want to mention is uh, supporting network operators. Um, so uh, around the world, uh, there's, there are a host of network operators, uh, well-known names, uh, folks like Orange and South Korea Telecom and VTE in China uh, and, and dozens and dozens of others that are deploying uh, LoRaWAN technologies in conjunction 
with their own LTE-based uh, solutions because they see this, this, uh, this uh, multifaceted opportunity in the market. One of the things that's unique here, though, is, is that uh, using tools like, uh, like the tools that Center provides and others provide in the space, you can, um, you can enable the deployment of these networks even in non-traditional uh, environments, so where a utility might become an operator. We have opportunities to, to bring service into areas that otherwise it might be difficult to justify um, the infrastructure expenses of a traditional um, kind of LTE-based uh, solution. Uh, and some of those, uh, you know, just um, relate to uh, you know, agricultural applications and oil and gas applications, but also how you provide um, very rapid deployments of, of enterprise solutions. <clears throat> David mentioned this. Uh, one of our one of our uh, one of our key uh, use cases here is uh, is actually in fuel delivery. Uh, so not uh, necessarily next to the pumping station, but broadly, uh, every single fuel tank that a that a distributor has can be monitored. Uh, not just for full empty, but to optimize delivery uh, services uh, for that. Uh, we have uh, use cases here in an ROI study uh, that shows that the, you know, the deployment of these, these solutions can yield a, a positive ROI um, in less than one year uh, with, uh, with these kinds of services. And we're talking about um, the ability to instrument tanks uh, for uh, you know, less than $50, um, and have very, very low uh, connectivity costs as well. Uh, another one that has really been uh, one of the leading um, uh, use cases uh, for LPWA uh, worldwide uh, is around uh, the metering space. Uh, specifically here, we're looking at, uh, at water metering uh, capabilities. Uh, and again, these are, in many cases, these are technologies that have been transitioning from um, proprietary solutions, proprietary network solutions, or the first step of connectivity, which in many cases here was uh, what they call drive-by or walk-by readings using short-range wireless technologies, and bringing that back into a, a wide area solution that still provides end-to-end -end security and privacy uh, of that data uh, for the municipality, as well as the ability to uh, work with partners um, who are ideally suited for deploying the network assets. Uh, in order to support this. Uh, next, uh, I want to briefly talk about um, uh, agriculture. So uh, agriculture is another area that we see uh, as uniquely suited for these kinds of um, uh, low power wide area unlicensed solutions um, because in many cases, uh, cellular connectivity doesn't exist or is insufficient in order to provide uh, connectivity. Um, this is a one, one use case here where it is a, um, uh, a single upfront cost that includes lifetime co uh, connectivity for the device uh, to do um, uh, uh, irrigation monitoring. Uh, so this enables uh, the, the farmer or the co-op uh, to provide you know, more than 10x the, the resolution in the data granularity by adopting these, uh, this, this technology and deploying it. Um, and as you can see there, this use case uh, specifically highlights a 3x ROI versus the previous um, cellular-based solutions. Um, <clears throat> I want to wrap up with just a few elements to talk about uh, the requirements of how we do this at scale. Um, and again, some of these are in, in, in alignment with, uh, with the LTE-based um, initiatives. Uh, that David was mentioning before, uh, but there's some specific um, specific things that we think are are uniquely required uh, and available now in order to do this. Uh, again, we agree open standards based technology uh, is absolutely required in communications fields. Um, and again, uh, a diverse ecosystem of chip and device makers and network operators and system integrators. Uh, there are over 500 member companies in the Laura Alliance today that provide all of those aspects. Uh, based upon the, the open standard of the, of the LoRaWAN specification. Um, one of the things that I think is unique in this space and one of the goals of, uh, of the unlicensed technologies and LoRaWAN specifically uh, is to facilitate a very, very long technology refresh cycle. So um, as opposed to what we're seeing and even um, was, uh, was discussed briefly about the, the advent of 5G and, and what that's going to mean and how uh, spectrum gets reformed in order to support those, those technologies, uh, you know, we're looking at supporting in the water uh, utility case, for example, 
15 or 25 year product lifecycle um, requirements uh, on top of a single uh, connectivity technology. Um, and that's absolutely required for these you know, set it and forget it uh, 10 plus year uh, use cases. Um, ubiquitous IoT network coverage, again, uh, similar there. We don't uh, necessarily believe that uh, a single operator needs to provide all of that connectivity, um, but uh, certainly all of these different disparate kinds of connectivities need to be available, uh, and they need to be connected and brought to, uh, to the application provider so that they can choose uh, the best technology for, for the application. Um, just a, a few things there. I think when we do comparisons uh, of technologies and looking at battery life and looking at uh, range and various things like that, it's critically important to kind of get real use cases uh, and to drive those down to, to, the, uh, to the hard numbers. And in our analysis, we see that there's still uh, you know, two to three times uh, performance benefit of the low-end technologies with respect to overall system cost, uh, life cycle, uh, battery life, uh, they, these sorts of things versus the existing um, LTE, LTM-based uh, solutions. Um, but this ubiquitous network IoT, uh, IoT network coverage also needs to be delivered against a very disparate set of use cases, whether that's uh, you know, a remote location for oil and gas uh, uh, extraction, uh, or whether that's a dense indoor application, or whether it's an enterprise solution that's being deployed against hospital campuses. Um, and again, we think we have a unique advantage in bringing those disparate use cases together and connecting them to facilitate a global manufacturing solution where devices are built once and be able, and able to be deployed worldwide. Um, <clears throat> the the um, the last three really deal with you know, how applications are brought to market, and I think one of the things I want to highlight here is these are certainly things that, that have existed historically in the cellular side of the, of the world, uh, but also exist now in a low power uh, wide area networks for our license spectrum uh, that we're dealing with now. With uh, the companies I mentioned in the operation space, with all of the ecosystem partners, uh, and with companies uh, like Tenet that can provide the expertise to, uh, to bring applications to bear. Uh, using these uh, using these new technologies, um, and uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, hand it over to uh, to Z, I believe, uh, for the uh, for the, the next section. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Let me give you a little bit of information about Eris, who we are, and what we're up to. I am the uh, Z Hossein. I am the CTO and founder of the company. We've been involved in the business of providing services for M2M and IoT for more than 21 years at this point. Uh, frankly, since the days of 1G, I love the slide that uh, David Allen put up about the technology that has changed in the cellular industry over that time. We had M2M applications back in those days and have evolved over the years to go digital, etc. cetera. Uh, we are uh, based in California, in San Jose, California. Headquarters are right here, although we have a global presence and services around the world. Uh, more than 250 people, Essentially, half of us are engineering and operations, and we have headquarters here in San Jose. Uh, that slide, unfortunately, shows Santa Clara. We literally moved about three or four days ago, and I haven't had a chance to update that one slide. We have operations in Chicago, in England, in India, Japan, and op opening offices elsewhere in, in the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian markets. Our network operating centers are located right here in the Bay Area, uh, including a second one in Vegas in London and Delhi, and, and at some point in the near future, we'll have uh, sprinkled more around the world as our services evolve uh, to expand globally. In terms of the number of cellular connections, which is where we focus today, although we have hybrid applications using Wi-Fi and satellite, we're the sixth largest in the United States. Uh, in North America, we're third behind AT&T and Verizon, but globally, we're number six behind five large giant uh, operating and providing M2M cellular IoT services around the world. Let me stand back, having you know, having had the experts who talked about the uh, the way the technologies work. Let me sort of expand a little bit about where cellular is evolving based on information that is provided publicly, and then therefore where we are evolving and how we're going to take advantage of these technologies uh, in the future. Ericsson provided a mobility report about a year ago that showed the increasing growth of LTE compared to the other two technologies, uh, 2G and 3G technologies, if you will, that are in, in wide use today, that within the next three to five, six years, you will see LTE become the, the dominant 
uh, technology for cellular operations around the world. And then 5G will be starting off right around 2019, 2020, and, and slowly growing from that point onwards. So clearly there's an evolution going on and a change in technology going on that we want to take advantage of, and we are taking advantage of, to deploy M2M and IoT devices that uh, use these technologies in the future. On the other hand, these, these numbers currently show what's happening in perhaps more of a smartphone LTE environment, and therefore what else is possible, and, and David, both the Davids uh, elaborated on the other low-power, wide-area network technologies that uh, are available and are going to be available in the near future. The, as mentioned by everybody else, the numbers are staggeringly large. If you look at what's uh, uh, a, a prediction made by Machina Research that by 2025, you'll see 30 billion IoT devices. Now, whether you believe that number or not, or if it's off by a factor of two, doesn't really matter. It's really important to note that this is going to be a huge market. Of that 30 billion, their prediction is that 7 billion, a significant percentage will be a combination of cellular and low-power wide area networks. Uh, they do show low power wide area networks as being larger than cellular, and that's not surprising because of the cost considerations and perhaps also the fact that most M2M and IoT applications, not all, but most applications tend to only a small amount of data, and therefore the LPWA app uh, technologies are particularly well suited to those kinds of applications, and therefore cellular may not necessarily be a strong component of those uh, uh, application deployments. Uh, this is a slight variation of the information that David Allen provided. Sequence did a little bit of a study here to show what, what the uh, technologies in the LTE space could support. Uh, and they included NB1 at, as a possibility for kind of things that you might want to do from sensors and low-power devices, HVAC control systems, things that don't need to send much more information beyond a basic reading perhaps once a day or a few times a day, or might need to be able to send information when they're triggered. Perhaps a smoke detector only sends heartbeats that uh, it keep alive messages that say I'm alive and I'm okay, diagnostic messages, and then only need to send information when they actually detect a fire. And those kinds of technologies don't really need a high capacity environment. They, and CAD-M solutions that are being deployed would be perfectly fine for those kinds of applications. And as you go up that chain, you see wearables and meters, which perhaps would take advantage of CAD-M technologies because you can have a little bit more data, a little bit more throughput. Bidirectional control might be more uh, effective, and some of those applications may need voice, which would be, uh, as mentioned by David as well, CAD-M would be a logical choice for them rather than using NB-IoT. And then, of course, when you have applications that need a significant more uh, data transmission requirement, such as point-of-sale terminals or perhaps uh, telematic solutions in vehicles, all the way up through uh, basic connected uh, devices that require, in the, in, perhaps in the healthcare space, that require more data transmissions than are possible with CAT-M, you'd want to pick a CAT-1 solution. And finally, all the way up at the top, when you have a high data uh, requirement, um, high, high thr throughput requirement, as well as high capacity requirement of how much data you want to send, you'll see applications that may be include functionality with cellular gateways, routers, uh, as well as in-car automotive, in-car entertainment systems, etc. Video surveillance starts falling into that category as well. We have customers who've been looking at that and realizing that CAT M1 simply wouldn't suit their needs, and therefore they're going with CAT1 and CAT3 radios today. And obviously, this technology support, this whole stack of LTE technology support is a natural for these kinds of range of applications. And M2M IoT applications are all over the map in terms of small capacity all the way up to large capacity devices. And it's only going to continue to evolve in that direction. I'd like to take a slightly different comparison between what I call standards-based LPWA versus the proprietary LPWA standards to me comprise the technologies that are based on the 3GPP standards that are that fit well within the LTE space, such as CAD-M, NB-IoT, et cetera. And what I call proprietary LPAWA technologies are the SIGFOXs, the engineers of the world. I put LoRa into the category as well, not because it isn't standards-based, but because it isn't a 3GPP standard, and it's using a slightly different protocol, obviously, than the others who are focused in that market. That's a bit from the perspective of coverage, and that's a very important criteria for many of our customers. When you have a standards-based LPWA technology, the fact that the coverage can be enormous is very, very simply driven by the fact that if a carrier selects it and uses it, 
piggybacked on top of their natural smartphone deployments, their natural towers and backhauls that they use for the people who are, who are using those uh, technologies for other consumer purposes, they can achieve large coverage very quickly. And David didn't mention this, but frankly, AT&T and Verizon, certainly in the United States and other countries around the world, could deploy standards-based LPWA very quickly because it's piggybacking on, on spectrum as well as backhaul that they're using for other purposes. When a proprietary LPWA technology needs to go out there, that coverage becomes tough to do. In smaller nations, like in the European market, some of the technologies have been more successful to be, give you, you know, sort of better coverage in an, on a uh, nation scale, where nation is generally pretty small. But the act of deploying an LPWA network in, the, in North America would be an incredibly expensive proposition. And so you have to be selective. You have to deploy where you have customers. And potentially, in a sense, you might be limiting the kinds of applications to regional deployments until that network growth occurs and can support the kinds of technologies, uh, excuse me, the kind of applications that would be available in more rural areas. The other category is private networks. I mean, generally speaking, in the standards-based arena, the carriers are providing public networks. So if someone wants to set up a dedicated LTE network, it wouldn't be possible because they wouldn't have the spectrum necessarily available to them. Uh, whereas in the proprietary LPW space, that's exactly what you can do because you can create private networks, in particular with LoRa, although Senate is clearly providing public access into what they're up to. If a customer wanted to deploy a private network by buying a gateway and a bunch of in a regional or maybe even in a, in, in a small location where they have a, a manufacturing plant perhaps or something like that, that's possible and viable for them to do as long as they get a backhaul from somebody, whether it's cellular or satellite or something like that. Uh, spectrum, in the case of standards, you have a dedicated managed license spectrum, so it's a very known quantity. You can assume that there's going to be certain degrees of congestion and the carriers can manage that. Whereas in unlicensed, you could have congestion problems in larger cities, and the various technologies use different protocols and different approaches to achieve uh, a good performance even in an, in an unlicensed spectrum. Um, that may be one of the issues that could occur further down the road as these billions of units get deployed. You will need to find more unlicensed spectrum, and that's going to be a little bit of a tougher proposition down the road. Obviously, both approaches have relatively low-cost uh, modules. And uh, generally speaking, in the case of the service cost, again, low-cost services, uh, the carrier will be pricing it in the case of standard. And uh, I mentioned free to low in the case of proprietary LPWA because if you set up a private network, you have the cost of operating the network, but there is no service cost per se because you have your own private network. Longevity. This is where I'm a little concerned about some of the technologies that are being deployed. Uh, in the case of standards-based technologies, it is determined by the carrier. Their, pro their deployments of technologies are subject to the other applications that they use their spectrum for. Uh, and in time, there's evolution that needs to occur. Whereas in the proprietary LPWA cases, when you're deploying, particularly when you're deploying billions of units out there and you're supporting many protocols, generally speaking, the assumption is that these technologies can last for a long, long time. And, and one of the things that uh, I will mention along these lines is that when you have an application that is not close to a human or is not managed or operated by a human, and in particular when at scale, when you have millions to billions of devices out there, the cost of touch, the cost of replacement, the cost of upgrades may become prohibitively expensive if the technology changes too soon. And therefore, one of the edges, one of the, the, one of the benefits that proprietary LPW may have is longevity of service. Let's look at 5G. I mean, what were the technical objectives of 5G? There were five basic ideas that were, that were promoted. The first one was that there were, it would have a high uh, amount, uh, the tremendous amount of data increases, 1,000 times more data would be necessary. There was the assumption that there would be many, many more devices that would be connected, I, IoT and M2N devices. Typically, the end user data rates would be enormous, somewhere between one and 10 gigs per sec, gigabits per second. Very low latency. And, and then long battery life. Now, all of these five objectives are not necessarily achieved simultaneously. If you're going to do it a uh, 10 gigabit per second radio, there's no way you're going to achieve 10 years of battery life. The point is that you have to find and balance the specific application that has a specific need. But the point of 5G was to try and achieve a, a capability that allowed both coexist in a, in a networked environment that would make it viable for both the high-end users who use smartphones as well as the low-power battery users who use the, uh, the who are doing IM2M -IM IoT deployments. This chart, I think, from, uh, from GSMA technology, this chart sort of ex shows you the kind of range where 
5G starts to become very useful. At the bottom left-hand corner, you see the low data rate, low la or when I say low latency, I mean l large values of latency, uh, higher values of latency, which are which don't uh, necessarily impact the application, such as if you're monitoring a sensor network. Alarms, you might want, not want to consider being on the bottom left, but at the same time, if you're monitoring a basic temperature sensor somewhere or you're doing an irrigation monitor, you don't need very high throughput. You don't need uh, fast uh, latency or a very good latency. And then as you go up the, the, on the, each axis, as the throughput increases or the latency goes down and becomes better, you start seeing applications which can be achieved in those particular cases. The white rectangle shows the services that we achieved today with all the way up through 3G and 4G networks. And then the gray rectangle shows what is, could be enabled by 5G. And some of those capabilities, autonomous driving, augmented reality, virtual reality, et cetera, all of those are going to require very, very low latency, high throughput uh, kind of uh, technology availability. And obviously, there's a broad range of capability over here that is being shown in these slides. So in, in summary, I think what I'd like to say is that you have technologies that are available today for M2M and IoT applications, and then you will have services that will be available down the road. One important point that I think everyone needs to appreciate about 5G is that it's not going to necessarily, necessarily replace 4G and uh, uh, deployments today. It incorporates 4G within its transport. LTE will be a fundamental part of 5G, and as 5G applications and 5G technologies and 5G networks become available within the 2020 and onwards timeframes, uh, as carriers select that and, and test and deploy, 4G will continue to exist. The GSMA data, which I, I, I didn't want to get too bogged down into what the timeframes might be, but the 4G uh, data from GSMA, the data from GSMA shows 4G lasting through the middle of 2035 at least, and then on beyond that as is necessary. So that's pretty much what I have in terms of information about this topic. And I turn it back over to you, Colin, for any uh, questions or if, uh, and from the audience or yourself. Wonderful. Thank you, Z, and thanks to all our speakers. Um, yes, now we will move on to the Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, there's still time to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, attendees. We have lots of great questions already, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, and I'd like to start with one of my own. Um, I'm hearing a lot of talk from, from every one of you about um, uh, different technologies, different solutions, different um, use cases. Uh, Joe, I think you mentioned the, the F word, which, of course, is fragmentation. Um, how will that scenario evolve over the next several years, or will it necessarily? And I'm going to throw that out there to the panel. Anybody who wants, uh, who has a voice on that, is welcome. Well, let me start by saying that I, it, fragmentation is is real today. We see we see that definitely uh, holding the market back a bit as people try to make decisions about which which uh, formats they should use and how to package their data together. Um, as, as we move forward, there will be some silos that choose a technology and run with that. And once they get millions of devices in the field, it's very hard for them to change. So that, that fragmentation will live on. Uh, I think the, the force that counters that that sort of balances things is the economy of scale. And as we, as we build up economy of scale, for example, in LoRa devices uh, and get those chipsets down to even lower uh, dollar figures, then, then I think some of the uh, competing formats will drop away. If they, don't, if they don't have the same economy of scale, they're going to they're gonna, uh, be replaced in the market. So uh, I, personally, I think that's like a 10-year cycle, maybe even longer, uh, for these 65 different technologies to, to drop down to 30 technologies. Hey, Colin, this is uh, David Allen with AT&T. Um, another point of view is to also look at all these different technologies that are out there. It's really important to remember that for any given enterprise, they need a common solution or a common point of contact. So kind of to go back to, you need a common management platform, a management platform and a provider that can support high bandwidth capabilities, medium bandwidth capabilities, low bandwidth capabilities. You need a provider or a platform that can provide a common set of APIs, right? APIs that can be machine-to-machine -machine driven. Um, you need a portal that a customer can log into and see all of their, their devices, regardless of the technology that it's using. And, of course, a customer wants to have a single contract and all that information on a single bill. And so that's really kind of the one thing that puts it all together. Ultimately, what an enterprise customer is going to ask themselves is, 
is my solution provider going to be there? Are they going to be there today? Are they going to be there tomorrow? And are, going to be, are they going to be there in three to five years from now? There are so many new entrants in the marketplace. That's probably the biggest question that an enterprise asks themselves. Thank you, David. Anything else from in on there? there? Yeah, please. Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead. There. Um, I love the fact that David actually stole my thunder. I was, <laughs> was going to in, indeed uh, talk about exactly the same thing. Um, but that's great. I mean, I uh, agree with him 100%. The ability to manage a disparate set of networks is incredibly important. Ultimately, a device could indeed be a hybrid device. We have that situation today where we have units that have both Wi-Fi and cellular on board or a combination of satellite and cellular, and we manage that from a single device presence perspective. And that's the important point, is that if you can manage the effective use of it, no matter what transport is using, including the ability to reach out and touch it, no matter which mode it's in, that's incredibly important. And it's something that we focused on for a long, long time. Because uh, when we started out back in the 1G days, it was cellular and cellular only. And then when we migrated to digital, there was a natural use of multiple technologies. Indeed, we have some transport systems that use both what I call the sort of the competitive religious war technologies of both CDMA and GSM because they may be moving from northern tips of Canada using satellite, using uh, today using 3G HSPA in Canada down through 2G, 3G CDMA in the United States and then back over to GSM back in uh, and 2G GSM down in Mexico. So the need for managing that one device that has a wide set of technologies is incredibly important. And, and being able to reach out and touch it, no matter which mode it's in, is incredibly important. Now, having said that, one other comment I might make, and this is, this is sort of business 1.0, is that in time, some of those technologies will go away, whether it's going away from a technical and, and other purposes, uh, such as you know, replacements of cellular technologies as, as happened already, or happens because a company is not financially sound enough to exist in the future, those are going to happen. And we will see a natural dropout in the next five, 10 years I think Joe mentioned this as well, that you will see fewer technologies, but as long as we can maintain a single viewpoint of a device out there, a single portal access of that device out there, we will have achieved what we're looking for. Yeah, and Colin, if I could chime in as well. Please. I think, uh, there's there's two two things I'd like to, to comment on. So so one of them is I do think that we are starting to see a you know the beginning of a winnowing of some of the some of the disparate technologies that are showing up um, around the ones that have the strongest ecosystems and have the, you know, have the framework of the open specifications to support them. But to, to mirror a bit of what Z was just saying, I think absolutely we see that that common platform and that common uh, interface and the set of APIs is very important. Where I think there is, is less surety in the market is, is that the role of an operator to provide, or is that an aggregation platform that is able to take many different technologies, both licensed and unlicensed technologies that exist today, whether that be Wi-Fi and cellular or lower LAN and cellular, and provide that as an interface up into um, up into an enterprise that's consuming that. And the, I think there's there's a lot of competition right now in that space, and I think there's a lot of interesting um, uh, activity going on there around providing those those interfaces into the uh, into the enterprise. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, I have a few questions here about 5G, and I'm just going to kind of um, um, compress them all into one hodgepodge question. Um, uh, one, a couple of questions here um, about what role will 5G play in, in these IoT markets? Will it take over when it arrives? Um, and also, will 5G leverage any of the RAN or core components of 4G, which uh, is an interesting question as well. So uh, anybody want to uh, step up and address those? Z Hussein here from Ares. Um, I think the, two points. One is that it's still a bit early to see exactly what 5G will achieve. But if the objectives are met, then the answer to your question is that it'll incorporate 4G within its uh, within its capability. So I don't see 5G replacing the components of 4G. In fact, if you look at this, the uh, architectural core network elements, they're additive. The 4G networks are built upon to achieve the 5G results with new elements. Uh, obviously, the radio access network will be completely different, assuming it's not 5G. If there's some key technology that is developed to be used um, at you know multiple gigahertz, uh, you know in the 50 or 60 gigahertz millimeter wave uh, ranges for the kinds of applications that would be necessary for perhaps let's say autonomous driving controls, that's going to be a very different rate. 
radio access network. So it will be additive. I don't see it replacing 4G networks. In terms of the, uh, the the role, whether 5G will take over, um, I don't see it taking over. Uh, certainly not, uh, the, given the, again, given the fact that LTE is part of 5G, I don't see it taking over. Plus, as we deploy these units, per, particularly in the LTEM space and the, and the uh, NB-IoT uh, technologies, you're going to see those applications continue to pay, play a role. 5G, I believe, at least today, I believe, and David Allen, you, you, you know, being with the carrier, you can probably correct this more accurately. Um, you're going to see that technology being deployed primarily in new spectrum to achieve the throughputs that they're they are trying to do without touching the older spectrum technologies that certainly in the early stages uh, and certainly where LTEM and, and NB-IoT is likely to be deployed. Yeah, so this is, this is Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Z. I have to agree with Basically, everything that Z just said, it's a very complementary technology. It's going to leverage a lot of the existing uh, network assets that are already put in place. And just to kind of, you know, not every vertical in use case requires that kind of bandwidth that 5G offers or that requires that kind of ultra-low latency that 5G offers. But there are some use cases and verticals that very much could use those things. And it was previously mentioned, you know, in the connected car space, the autonomous driving space. You know, the vehicle, the infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle communication, ultra low latency is very, very important to achieve those kind of objectives. Drones, you know, with out of, you know, non line of sight command and control for very ultra low latency communication is very, very important. So there are some use cases that will very much take advantage of what 5G has to offer, but not every use case requires that kind of capacity. 5G and 4G will continue to coexist, you know, well into the 20s and 30s. Uh, Thank Joe you, guys. Madden here. Just, just wanted to add one yeah, comment ahead, here on 5G is that, you know, we've, we've looked into this question of low latency by asking some, uh, some key industrial companies, uh, GE uh, and Rolls-Royce and jet engines. Uh, we've talked to uh, Toyota and Volkswagen and Honda and GM and Ford about the cars. And uh, one of the conclusions that we've come to is that a lot of these autonomous platforms um, are not really pushing for the one millisecond latency. So we don't, we don't think that uh, some of these platforms will be moving to 5G uh, anytime soon. Uh, they're taking in a lot of data, but they're making their decisions on board in these autonomous platforms. And the, uh, the, the latency for the connection to the cloud or the, uh, the data throughput uh, to the cloud is, is not really driving those applications right now. And I think those companies are more interested in a long life cycle uh, than they are in going to the uh, next standard. When it comes to positive control, uh, people have been talking about drones here, and I think that's that's a, a great example of where 5G will be uh, very important because uh, when you need to have that positive tactile control, uh, a human being taking over flying the drone to make sure the drone doesn't run over a kid, you know, that that kind of thing is, is I think, uh, really important, and it will be uh, legislated into uh, some kind of a mandate, I think, at some point in time. So I, I think we will see 5G filling a role, but, but it will be uh, in our forecast it's a lot more limited than what a lot of people believe. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Um, Joe, I'd like to stick with you for the next question, uh, just sticking with the broader theme of, of applications and use cases. Um, and I want to start with Joe, but I want to get anybody else's viewpoint who, who wants to offer one on this as well. Uh, what are the applications that drive the fastest growth in, in long-range IoT? What are you guys seeing? Well, yeah, there's there's a few that are moving extremely fast. Uh, uh, the, the applications for asset tracking, for example, are are uh, you know potentially explosive as as we look at things like FedEx packages. Uh, you know, some of these devices that could be tracked. Uh, when we reach a, a price point and a, an ease of use and so on that, that is at the right level, uh, I think that, that growth could be extremely rapid. Uh, and also, I think there's a lot of action going on in, in things like uh, 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 building automation um, and smart homes and things like that. Uh, so uh, as we go to larger buildings, and what we find is that the Bluetooth and Zigbee sort of format doesn't really work anymore. Uh, so there's a potential large area of growth in, in automating uh, larger enterprise buildings. Um, and then beyond that, there's a lot of industrial cases. Uh, that's where we get into a lot of the fragmentation where it's smaller things here and there. But, but overall, the industrial use cases combine for pretty strong growth. 
Z Hussein here, I'd like to add to that. In agreement with Joe, one of the things that I might give you is sort of what we experienced today is that although there is growth in every one of these applications, the healthcare industry somehow seems to be growing much more rapidly in terms of number of units being deployed. That may be a combination of the fact that they're finally discovering that uh, these longer range uh, applications are more uh, effectively suited for healthcare, uh, and the fact that some of the uh, more traditional approaches that have been taken in the past with landline or, or you know, uh, what I call landline, but Ethernet con uh, systems or Wi-Fi systems aren't proving as useful because of the lack of control of the transport, cellular and long-range IoT solution seems to be more viable over there. Now, that may change within five or ten years, but today the healthcare industry seems to be growing more rapidly than any others that we are experiencing. Yeah, and Colin, just to add one more, you know, point of view is the, uh, I'd like to touch upon that kind of with that generic full empty on-off use case. You know, we've, here at AT&T, over the years, we've seen many, many use cases that kind of fall into what I would call the full empty on-off use case, whether it's the button, whether it's the connected trash can, the connected, you know, oil storage container, those types of simple applications cross many, many, many different verticals. And, you know, I think you'll see LPWA really open up to make those economically viable going forward. Very good. Thank you. Um, we are running a little bit over, so I'm afraid this will probably have to be our last question. We had a lot of great questions today, and um, couldn't uh, this one coming up? Excuse me, I've got one more, and uh, I've got plenty in the chamber, but um, I, I want to ask at least one more. Um, we've had plenty of questions today, and we couldn't get to them all, but we will be getting back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar. Um, so this one I think is particularly interesting, and not something I had thought about before. Um, does the cellular industry expect pushback of distributed antenna systems and associated power equipment installation by cities to support IoT? Well, let me let me start on that one. Uh, at Mobile Experts, we we publish market study every year on DAS, and you know I would say that the DAS industry is is in a process of transitioning from from being operator funded to being enterprise funded. Uh, so you have buildings, uh, hospitals, and hotels, and so on that are interested in, in deploying wireless infrastructure. Um, I think their requirements may change as they start to consider IoT applications inside their building, uh, but it's still very early days. I mean, they're, they're, uh, I think they're early adopters that are looking at some of these things, but uh, it'll be many, many years before we see that really impacting their, in, their investments in, in building wireless uh, coverage. Anybody else want to see here? If I could, yeah, if I could yeah. just extend the question a little bit, which is that in general, you're going to see, uh, you know, a, a pushback by cities has always been the case with uh, regards to cellular uh, towers and and the like. But the equipment it keeps getting smaller, and I think the ability to, for us to deploy long range technologies. Uh, is going to continue to grow with smaller equipment necessarily that may not be as problematic. Plus, at least from our perspective, we have a couple of initiatives with cities who are willing to deploy these technologies simply because they see the benefit of IoT for their own applications. And when that happens, I don't see will I don't think the pushback will be as strong as you might expect otherwise. And just one final point from an unlicensed perspective, we see that as a very, very important part of the, you know, of, of the adoption of IoT globally. Um, and we see many folks, both in enterprise and municipalities and in governments that are very interested in participating uh, in that way. Very good. Thank you. Um, Again, just to reiterate, um, we did have some great questions. We have some that we were not able to get to, but we will get back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar, um, our people at Fierce Will. And um, I'd like to thank very much uh, our speakers for participating and having a really informative conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank all our attendees for uh, for registering and, and listening in and submitting so many great questions. Um, this webinar has been recorded. As I said earlier, you'll be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same audience link that, you, that was sent to you earlier. Thank you again for joining. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks once more to our speakers. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Bye-bye.